Hey everyone, it's Brian. And if you're listening in real time, Thanksgiving was just over two weeks ago. Christmas Day is just over two weeks from now. That means we're halfway through Christmas of 2023, and boy is it flying right on by. I hope you're making the most of it. Over here at Christmas Past Headquarters, we've been baking, making a gingerbread house, reading Christmas stories, and listening to lots of Christmas music. My son Dashiell really loves Deck the Hall this year, which he calls the La 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 song. That one will go in the old memory bank for sure. It is, after all, a season for making memories like that, and that brings us to the reason we're here together right now. One of my favorite parts of creating Christmas Past is sharing your Christmas memories. I love the warm connections I've had with so many of you over the years and the glimpses you provide into your Christmases past. So today I'm excited to take a break from the normal action and bring you an episode dedicated just to you and your Christmas memories. Of course, many Christmas memories have a toy at the center of them. Back in the 1970s, the daredevil Evil Knievel was an international sensation, gaining fame with stunts like attempting to jump the fountains at Caesar's Palace on a motorcycle. The Evil Knievel stunt cycle was a hot Christmas toy when it was introduced in the early 1970s, capturing the imagination of kids everywhere. But not only kids. Here's Robert in Ireland to tell us all about it. It must have been Christmas of 1979, and at the time in Ireland, one of the must-have toys that Christmas was an Evil Knievel stunt cycle. So I was very, very excited on Christmas morning when I went into our living room to see what Santa Claus had brought. I was a little confused when I opened the wrapping paper as the toy was out of the box but was still wrapped. And I asked my parents, did that seem strange that the toy was out of the box and what might have happened? But I remember my father telling me that Santa Claus makes every effort to test the toys from time to time to make sure that they're working for all the boys and girls on Christmas morning. And uh, I was quite charmed by his answer at the time. So listen, I just wanted to share that story and I want to wish you and all of the Christmas Past family a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I can't recommend Brian's book highly enough. All the best. Bye bye. Oh yeah, I do have a book out there. I haven't been talking about it much this season, but since Robert brought it up, yes, Christmas Past, the fascinating stories behind our favorite holidays traditions, is available in hardcover at fine booksellers everywhere, and also as an audiobook. Well, since the accents are so nice in Robert's general part of the world, let's stay there for another memory. This one comes to us from Graham in Scotland. Candy and Christmas go together quite naturally, but Graham and his family put the two together in their own uniquely and sweetly festive way. I have fond childhood memories of attending primary school in the weeks leading up to Christmas and the holidays. Winters in Scotland being cold, frosty and often with deep snow. I would pass a local shop on my way to school, stop in and buy these garish plastic fruits that contain sherbet. That's the fizzy powder that was very bad for my teeth. I'd always keep these empty plastic fruits, be it an orange, a lemon, a banana or apple, and take them home. Then, at home with my mother and brother, we would roll these plastic fruits in lots of glue and lots of colourful shades of glitter and make these Christmas decorations for our family tree. Yes, it was also lots of fun, and for my mother, no doubt, lots of clearing up. Later, I would stare in rapture at the completed tree, proud of our homemade additions to the festive season. I said just a moment ago that Christmas is a season for making memories. It's also, some say, a season of miracles. Or happy coincidences that feel like miracles. I'll let you decide, and I'll let McKenna tell the story. One that involves not her, but her mother, when she was a young child one Christmas many years ago. My mom would have been about five for this Christmas memory. She and my grandparents were stationed in Germany in the early 1970s. They were living in a village off base, renting a house from a German family who are still good friends of ours. Christmas has always been really important to my grandmother, and she loves Santa Claus. Well, on this particular Christmas Eve, after all the presents were wrapped and under the tree, except for those that would be delivered by Santa... My mom first decided to let my grandparents in on what she really wanted for Christmas. 
Apparently, all she hoped Santa would bring her was a doctor's kit. Well, my grandmother was heartbroken because there was no way she was going to be able to find a doctor's kit before morning, and she was devastated that this could be the Christmas my mom might stop believing. But it wasn't, because not half an hour later, their landlords, the Hansons, stopped by with gifts, and what do you think they brought my mother? Her very own doctor's kit. As far as my grandmother was concerned, it was a Christmas miracle, and since that day, she maintains that Santa Claus is real. He may not be a jolly, soot-covered stranger dressed in red who slides down the chimney, but his spirit and magic are unquestionable. And though we're all grown up now, Santa still delivers gifts to everyone in my family each year, wrapped in Santa-themed paper. Merry Christmas, everyone. I vaguely remember a doctor's kid among the toys in my house growing up. Maybe I had gotten it one Christmas or birthday, or maybe one of my siblings did. I don't know, nor do I know whatever happened to it. I don't think I still have any of the Christmas gifts I received growing up, but if I did, it would be because it was something special enough and meaningful enough to make it worth hanging on to. Just ask Erin in Indiana. Um, growing up, we did not have a lot of money, but somehow my parents always managed to make Christmas really special for us. And one of my favorite gifts, um, I was 10 years old, it was 1974, and I received the book Charlotte's Web from my parents. And I actually still have that book today. I am an elementary librarian, and I love to share my book with my students every year. My daddy wrote a beautiful little message to me in it, and um, now my parents are both gone, and I treasure that book greatly. Shout out to librarians everywhere, and shout out to giving books for Christmas, and shout out to Erin in particular for keeping Charlotte's Web all her life. Well, some gifts, like books, are small, and some, like the one Robin in Vancouver got one year, are big. But of course, it's not the size or the cost that we remember most about any gift. It's the meaning and memories that we carry with us all throughout the years. I wrote a book for my dad full of stories, um, remembering all of the cool things that he did to make Christmas so special over the years. And this is one small story from that. I was seven years old and it was Christmas morning. Outside was rainy and cold, but inside was warm and filled with sparkling garland. Presents crowded below our tree, pushing low-hanging branches to the side as they spilled into the living room. Santa had come! I clambered onto the couch next to the tree as we set to the task of handing gifts out one at a time. My older brother sat on the recliner, smiling crookedly at his sister's giddy joy. Halfway through the merriment, Dad turned to me with raised eyebrows and seriousness in his voice as he leaned forward. A smile hid at the edge of his mouth as he spoke. Robin, he began, I have to tell you something incredible that happened last night. I looked up at him with amazement. After you all went to bed and I had just fallen asleep, a tap on my shoulder startled me awake. I jumped up with a start because standing over my bed, as real as could be, was Santa Claus himself. Dad shook his head and his voice got quieter, as though he could barely believe it himself. I was listening with wide eyes. I got up, trying not to wake Mom, and walked out into the hall. Santa turned to me and said, I need your help. Follow me. So I follow. As we walked, he told me, Robin's gift. It's just too big this year. I can't get it through the chimney. You're going to have to help me get it into the house. Well, of course I agreed to help. He rose to his feet and beckoned with his hand for me to follow. I sprang up excitedly and we left the lights of the tree behind, making our way down the curved staircase with Mom and my brother in tow. As he walked, Dad continued telling them of the night's unbelievable events. Well, I helped Santa get the gift off the roof, but would you believe it? It was even too big to get through the front door. I had to open the garage door and bring it in there. We were in the basement now, and he was opening the door to the garage. Cool air poured over me as I looked into the dark room. He flicked on the light. A huge gift was sitting on the floor. A flurry of adrenaline filled me as I was told to unwrap it. Inside the shiny paper was a two-story dollhouse. I excitedly analyzed its contents. This was no ordinary dollhouse, not like the ones I'd seen in the department store catalogs. It was not pink. It was not plastic. It was wooden, hand-painted, with shingles nailed on the roof and a small wooden door on the front. Moving around the back to look inside, I bent down with awe. 
the flooring of the living room and the bedroom, I recognized that carpet. And in the bathroom, in the kitchen, that linoleum was familiar. Mom, look, it has the same floors as our house. Mom smiled. Well, Santa just knew. He's very smart. I stared at my gift with joy. It didn't matter whether or not I was sure that Dad had been telling the truth about how I got the gift. Something magical had happened either way. Dad was beaming, Mom was looking content, and my older brother seemed happy but was probably hoping to get back upstairs to see if a video game had arrived for him under the tree. I always love hearing when people do things like Robin has done and write their favorite Christmas memories down. Whether it's in the form of a journal, a printed book, a scrapbook, or what have you. Preserving memories helps us stay connected to our past and to each other, and it creates something special and valuable that can be shared. If those memories just live in your head, they leave the world when you do. I haven't done anything like what Robin did, but I try to do some of that through this podcast, and it's a big part of the reason I love sharing your memories like I'm doing now. So how about one for the road? You know that phrase, one for the road, refers to a final drink before leaving a place, so it's very fitting for this memory. You know who takes many ones for the road? Santa Claus. Children everywhere know that the way to thank jolly old Saint Nick for his visit on Christmas Eve is to leave out some milk and cookies. But that's not quite the way that Danielle in Ontario remembers things. I wanted to share a quick funny Christmas memory I have from my childhood. Growing up, I knew that most other people would leave out milk with the cookies for Santa, along with a carrot for the reindeer. But in my house, we didn't leave out milk. Instead, we left out ginger ale for Santa to enjoy with his cookies. I didn't think anything of it. I just thought, meh, everyone likes ginger ale, nothing suspicious about that. It wasn't until years later that I put it together that we had to leave out ginger ale because my dad is lactose intolerant. <laughs> I will never forget the substitution we made in our house on Christmas Eve to accommodate our Santa with dietary restrictions. Have a Merry Christmas! Well, that'll do it for this little bonus installment. I hope you enjoyed hearing everyone's memories as much as I did. Thanks to Robert, Eric, McKenna, Robin, Graham, and Danielle for sharing them. Now there's still time for you to share one this season, and all you have to do is record yourself speaking into your phone's voice memo app and send it to christmaspasspodcast at gmail.com. Keep it reasonably short, clean and family friendly, and be sure to say your name and where you're from. I'll be back again soon, and until then I'll remind you that Christmas Past is produced in wonderful Willow Glen, California, by yours truly, Brian Earl. You can reach out anytime, and I always love to hear from you. Again, I'm at christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com, and you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please do join our private Christmas Past Facebook group if you haven't yet. And hey, if you're really feeling the Christmas spirit, why not help more people discover the show? It's as simple as telling a friend about it or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. If you do leave a review, I'll send you a Christmas Past sticker and a handwritten Christmas card is my way of saying thanks. Reach out for details, and until we meet again, may your days be merry and bright. Mm -hmm.